Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, our final session today, uh, we're fortunate to have with us two senior level individuals who certainly have helped shape the peace operations conversation and activities for a number of years. Uh, first, we would like to hear from Major General Retired uh, Gordon, Senior Advisor for the Challenges Forum, and then he'll be followed up by uh, Dr. Victoria Holt, Deputy Assistant Secretary, Department of State Bureau of International Organizational Affairs. So, Major General Gordon. I've been given six minutes um, to talk to you. Uh, uh, this rapidly diminished group, I see. My goodness, where is everyone? Ah, okay. Uh, to talk to you before I hand over to Torley. Um, I just want to start again by observing uh, the serendipity of timing of this excellent seminar, uh, coming as it does at an increasingly difficult time uh, for UN peace operations, as articulated at lunch by the Under Secretary General at Seuss but also right after the release of the high-level panel's report. Um, this report has tried to address some of these Latsu's challenges and, and has boldly laid down a gauntlet, I would suggest, for all who have an interest or a concern in wider peace operations. As an aside, I think it's probably worth remembering the difference between interest and concern uh, by considering uh, the standard English breakfast of bacon and egg. Now, the chicken undoubtedly has an interest in the production of this fine breakfast dish, but I would suggest that the pig has a concern. Uh, uh, <laughs> and this is my theme. Because I would suggest also that all practitioners in peace operations, uh, from their grand strategic formulation in New York uh, to their operational and tactical execution in the field, are in the camp of the pig. They need to be concerned, really concerned. And now, while this seminar has not been about the panel report, it is inevitable that the gauntlet of the report has laid down will resonate for the next generation of practitioners. How we react to these challenges will help define how much we have understood of the significance of this seminar. So the link between the report and how well it is strategically communicated is central to whether it will really make a difference. And I think that speaks to the truism of strategic communications. That is not so much about how we communicate our actions, but more about what our actions actually communicate. It is therefore unsurprising that the report itself has something to say on the need, as Annika has identified, for radical improvement in the UN's strategic communications. When I was actively or more actively involved in the business of strategic communication, it was drummed into me that if you have a plan or make a decision without a communication strategy, you do not really have a plan or a decision. And this speaks to the centrality of strategic communication. It is a political and operational prerequisite for success, and as such has to be embedded in all our thinking and in all our actions. As Nick said this morning, peace operations do not succeed through hard power they succeed through soft power, which implies the primacy of the political process, a message heavily underscored by the high-level panel report, which in turn axiomatically demands good strategic communications. As Sven Erik Söder said at the beginning, if we are not seen or heard, we do not exist. We have heard, perhaps somewhat dryly, that strategic communication is a variety of techniques used to explain clarify and advocate the mission of peace operations to key target audiences. Now we have heard and discussed today, but using different terms, uh, the three core functions and their challenges of strategic communication in modern peace operations. And I would suggest those three core functions are firstly to inform, 
That's talking about shaping the narrative, to have a story, having a viable product, and to tell that story in a way that the public and the target audience understands. And we've spoken at length about that. The second core factor, I think, is to influence how to change behavior and perceptions. Of note, the UN Staff College believes that communication is strategic when it supports and promotes a key objective. The ultimate goal of communication is to facilitate, they go on, a change of behavior rather than merely to disseminate information. But we know and we've heard today that this is not easy and requires really good analysis, good strategies, and the effective deployment of a multiplicity of technologies. The third core function we have also identified, but we didn't call it that, is to protect. Essentially, the image of the mission and the image of the organization. To do this, we really need to understand and listen to public perceptions, understand the need for conversations and dialogue, and perhaps most of all, the need for good internal communications and consistent and coherent messaging. Most of all, we have to walk the talk, because if we don't, we'll be let down by it. I believe that these core functions are broadly understood within the UN system and those who support it, but they are understood from the chicken's perspective. They are of interest. I sense that this rather theoretical senior level consent for the need can sometimes founder on the bewildering pace of change and emerging challenges inherent in the new communication and digital social media technologies. As such, the default setting tends to be, let's leave this to the experts. Or even worse, uh, let's leave this completely. Uh, there are undoubtedly issues of multiculturalism and generation-driven comfort zone issues here, which means that our current set of leaders, with a few notable exceptions, do not recognize that they must be actively concerned with these changes. I do believe, however, that this, this seminar has given us a much better handle on how, to, on how UN leaders and people of influence to the UN can do better in their strategic communications for the UN. After all, it has to be a concern, as we heard this morning from Christina, that extremist organizations such as Islamic State have demonstrated a sophistication in using the new technologies for strategic communication in a way that makes the UN's effort look archaic. And that is our challenge. I sense that today we have set an agenda for the Challenges Partnership, which Annika recognized and noted at the beginning of the day, in that through a better understanding of the need and the techniques to communicate better, we can support the implementation process of the identified changes needed to improve peace operations. And after all, at the end of the day, that's why we're here. Thank you very much. I hope that's done a degree of justice to all our interventions today. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Tori to really put the icing on the cake. So, thanks, sir. If I could just take 30 seconds, um, because I, I, I made an error, uh, and I didn't, I didn't read your bio. And, and so I want to just take 30 seconds to be able to do that. It's all written here. It must be a long day for me. So anyways, my apology is not an excuse. So here's why you should have been paying close attention to Major General Gordon. <laughs> He's had a full career in the British Army, including serving as sector commander in Unperfor in Bosnia in 94-95, and being the British Army's director of corporate communications, culminating in command of the British Army in Scotland and the north of England. He served as a force commander, both in the UN mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea, and he retired in 2005. And since then, has worked on projects, UNDPKO, UNOIOS, the World Bank, UNDP, and the British government and others as an international lecturer, mentor, and consultant on peacekeeping operations. He also co-wrote and helped develop the UN's first strategic level doctrine, the Capstone Doctrine for Peacekeeping, <laughs> He's a senior advisor to Challenges Forum, special advisor until 2013 to the late Pearson Peace, Peace Center of Canada. And in 2005, 
He helped develop the UNDPKO Senior Mission Leadership Training Program and since has been the lead mentor on all 21 UN courses. So I hope, I hope uh, you didn't need this to pay attention uh, to his experience and, and what he had to say. So again, sir, my apologies for that. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'd like to introduce Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Dr. Victoria Hope. She joined the Bureau of International Organization Affairs as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in August of 2009. Her portfolio includes issues before the Security Council, peace operations, sanctions, and the UN political affairs. It's enough to keep you busy, I think. Prior to assuming this position, she was a senior associate at the Henry L. Stimson Center, a Washington, D.C.-based think tank, where she co-directed the Future of Peace Operations program. During her tenure at Stimson, she wrote and spoke on peace and security issues, including the UN and regional peace operations, protection of civilians, targeted sanctions, rule of law, and U.S. policy. She is a graduate of the Naval War College and Wesleyan University. Ms. Holt. Thanks very much. Years ago, I was, uh, I just left a different administration. I left the State Department. NGO asked me to travel with them to a country that was an emerging democracy. And we got briefed by the ambassador on these immense plans and how the U.S. was deeply engaged and how they were really communicating about democracy. And so I did ask about their, how they were communicating with the world. And he said, well, you need to meet, I forget the guy's name, Bob. So when I sat down with Bob. I said, Bob, how do you do this? And he said, well, I have a fax machine. <laughs> I was like, okay. Even then I knew that probably a fax machine alone would not be able to cover a highly populous country that was emerging from military rule uh, and support democracy. But I think we've come a long ways from those days. And so for many of us, we may feel like we're still catching up with modern technology and trying to see how it links to peace operations and the efforts of uh, the international community on peace and security. But we have moved forward. So I'm gonna stick to my strategic message, which is two things. One how, as Nick Burnback earlier said, we need to take back the narrative on peacekeeping. And second, how we can do that, coming up with the events that are happening later this year. I do want a, a sober moment here. Uh, between walking back and forth to the State Department, I got a little email about another accusation of sexual exploitation abuse against UN peacekeepers. That cuts through all the emails I get. I get emails on everything in the world, but this is what makes headlines. Now, why is that? And why is that the story I'm getting about peacekeeping in a country where I know people are risking their lives to protect civilians? It's because it is the main narrative that we unfortunately get covered, and I will come back to that. I also think at the strategic level, we actually have seen serious challenges. When missions are upholding something that's politically unpopular, Governments and civilians, sometimes not civilians, but their opponents will fight back. And I remember the case in Cote d'Ivoire when we all woke up and found two people both claiming to be president after the elections there. And the UN certified the election, said, sorry, one is a legitimate leader of this country. And we had a protracted political set of pressures while the peacekeeping mission was there to try and squeeze the process so one would depart. And as the end game was coming closer, I remember reports that the government had put on a loop Hotel Rwanda on the national television to communicate, do not trust the UN, they are not reliable and they will not protect you. So you know, even this is not a new question for any of us. But as far as taking back the narrative, I can say because I travel to peacekeeping missions and so does my team, that there are too many stories that are not heard, that are very positive and actually extraordinary bravery at times. I think of the civilian who stood outside the compound in Bor soon after the crisis in December 2013. And when military, armed military came up and demanded to be let in to see who were their political opponents, he politely pointed to a tree and said, you can meet with them over there. And when they came up and threatened him, he turned around and said, close the doors. And he told me, it's just me and two other guys and we were unarmed and all of them had arms. That standoff in the end saved thousands probably, or at least hundreds of lives. They backed down, he had to leave the country. But many of us have never heard these stories. You can imagine what happened in Haiti after the earthquake 
when the very people whose phones were ringing were themselves injured and trying to recover as their colleagues, had many too many, had died. Or in Syria, as unarmed observers bravely went in to try and deter what we've seen since, which is extreme violence. When you hear news about Mali in a peace accord or an attack, we don't know the names of the people who are serving there or who's making the difference in the negotiations or with a local community, but they're there. This is an immensely powerful narrative. It's one that many of us know parts of, but how do we better communicate it? It's the reason why governments, NGOs, academics, and those of us engaged in this care about these missions, because we know all these people. I think it's over 120 countries contribute, civilians, police, military. It's not cookie cutter, but every day I'm impressed when I go out to meet people I've never met in my life who have a Security Council resolution and they're trying to do the best they can with what they have. So, how do we help lift this up? Obviously, we've got a few opportunities this year. One is a high-level panel that's just been released, which is a great opportunity. In some cases, there are things in there that have been known amongst maybe many of us, but let's lift them up and say it's not okay to have this problem set. Let's band together and say, let's figure out, because we want these missions to succeed, how we solve some of those problems. Uh, many of us have been going to regional conferences that were kicked off last fall after the summit on peacekeeping and are leading up to a second summit, which we're proud that President Obama will be at, along with Secretary General and other governments, to talk about how together countries are going to contribute more of core capacities to UN missions, whether it's personnel, enablers, or skills that the UN is in short supply of having access to. DPKO has already taken advantage of this. I must laugh a little bit. Strategic Force Generation and Planning Cell. Does not trip off the tongue. Why are we so excited about this? It's basically an office that you can call if you're interested in peacekeeping as a government, and they will help solve your questions. Thank you. That's what it really is. Uh, strategic force generation and planning is really about how you get countries that may either want to expand into different areas of peacekeeping, or maybe for the first time, can have that conversation and say, over the next two to five years, this is what we're interested in. How do we go from here to there? All of these are things that I think help us have an opportunity to talk about what peacekeeping is about, why it supports ending uh, war and conflict, why it supports fragile peace, why it's made up of not just military, uh, but also police, civilians, and dedicated diplomats who volunteer to go to countries they may not have ever seen on a map before and do their best on behalf of the international community. So finally, just on the summit, our government and others are working together to try and get as many countries to come and commit something new at that event. And that's just, that's not the end. I think that's the beginning of a much more robust and engaged dialogue. And doing so, all of us can help change the narrative about peacekeeping and basically validate that it matters and we're here to basically fill in those gaps rather than say, ha, too bad that mission wasn't able to do X, Y, Z. So thank you very much to Folk Bernadette, to US Institute of Peace, and obviously to the Challenges Forum for bringing us together. It's always a good opportunity to meet colleagues from across the world and sometimes down the street. Uh, thank you again. So General Gordon and, and uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Holt, thanks so much for taking the time uh, to spend with us today. And thanks for sharing your insights and remarks. And we look forward to hearing about the successes for the upcoming summit. Uh, it's now my privilege to once again ask Ms. Annika Hilding Norberg to come up, uh, the, the director and founder of Challenges Forum, and to provide some thoughts on looking towards the future. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. And uh, before I start, I would like to say special thanks to uh, Robert Gordon and Victoria Holt for concluding our substantive discussion here today with your very thoughtful and uh, illuminating, insightful reflections on both the issues that have been discussed and the challenges facing us uh, ahead. We are indeed uh, facing tremendous uh, challenges to modern peace operations. This, I think, have come through uh, throughout the day. Um, at the same time, I believe there is also an, an historic opportunity to make a positive difference. There is a global momentum for change uh, generated by the various panel reports and also, of course, the galvanized interest in making a difference. And it is my hope that 
this time around, just as 15 years ago when the Brahimi report uh, galvanized the international community to really make a difference. I hope this opportunity will find itself with us also now. The purpose of the workshop was, of course, to uh, contribute, to generate new ideas uh, for strategic communications in support of UN peace operations. It was also meant to mobilize support for making that happen, both to the UN headquarters, but also to member states who wants to support that effort. And if I can uh, just add uh, something, it was mentioned earlier that uh, there is 150 people supporting the 125,000 in terms of uh, public affairs and public information. But this is people in the field. And my attention was drawn to the fact that from a strategic point of view, at the strategic level, there's actually six people supporting 125,000. And this at the UN headquarters means there's one chief, one deputy, two desk officers, and uh, one project officer. There's no digital media officer in the DPKO DFS. Sometimes that, those duties are undertaken by a graphic uh, expert and a support staff. So, and I believe that is, or some, someone call it, it's no way to run a railroad. I would like to say, though, that of course, the DPK DFS benefits from support from the DPI, colleagues in the DPI. But in terms of having a dedicated in-house capacity, in DPKO, DPF, uh, DFS to develop the strategic communication, uh, the resources are negligible. So, despite the financial constraints, I hope when it is time for member states to decide to recruit the 125,001 peacekeeper, I think it would be a very well invested resource if that would be the first digital media officer in DPKO, DFS. I think that's what, one of the things that I'm taking out of the conversation today, because they need it. They need all of our support. We have learned much from the great range of expertise and speaking to us today, and which was very articulated, uh, reflected in the uh, presentations just made. I would like to add uh, one uh, particular, I think, interesting issue, which was not uh, included in the presentations today. And this was the absolutely recent um, move by the global review of peace operations into the digital world, uh, which the CIC at the NYU in New York has been doing for a long time, but now finally, just days ago, put on digitally. It's an enormous resource that I think very much also help all of us develop our strategic communication capacities. And I think I wanted to highlight that as a particular resource that we can all access as of last week. I'm still thinking of moving into the digital age, as you see on my notes here. But focusing, therefore, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, chairs for their contributions this week. It has been extremely illuminating for myself, and I've heard from many colleagues as well. And I would also like to uh, thank the uh, participants who have come uh, either from far uh, or from New York or from Washington. I think everyone bringing the different expertise and experiences and of course bringing the newfound insights back to their countries and functions and responsibilities will be very useful. I would also like to thank the partners of the Challenges Forum specifically because everything we do in Challenges builds towards the next effort. So the results coming out of this meeting I will return to very shortly. But the meeting that we came uh, to uh, focus on here, built very much on the findings of the Design in Madness and Capabilities report. And that was an effort that I would like to thank the, our partners from Germany, India, Nigeria, France, USA, United States, Pakistan, and partners from Canada and South Africa for having spearheaded over the past two years. Also, Japan was kindly to support the launch of that event which was meant to the uh, Gen Secretary General. Tomorrow, we will have a wrap-up session uh, with DPKO DFS, identifying the key takeaways from the discussions here, building on the findings of our concluding speakers. So the organizer, 
with, uh, in contact with DPKO, DFS will see what we can take further and make into practical uh, recommendations. A summary report by the organizers will be sent to you in a few weeks' time, and we look forward to continue working on this subject as one of the work strands over the next year. So we invite you to stay engaged, stay tuned, and stay online. And before closing, it is my honor to extend our collective thanks to the colleagues that were not mentioned this morning, but who really have made this meeting a reality. And I would like to then invite you to, uh, you to join me in thanking them. From the United States Institute of Peace, our main hosts here, uh, I would like to extend our thanks to uh, George Lopez, uh, to Peter Logo, of course, for the background paper that really I heard very clearly Robert referring to in his concluding remarks, and I think for me also learning much, putting things in perspective. Jeff Helsing, Jim Roof, of course, who has been central to this process, uh, as with uh, Kelly Mader. We also have a Selena Cano, and uh, Jocelyn Walker, and Matt uh, Witt, Jamie Schillinger, Steve Watson, Brian Hammond. Remember, this is recorded, so if the person is not here, they will still know about it. Uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank our colleagues at the Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute, which of course have been focused ever since 1997 in the challenges sphere. And uh, there I would also like to add our thanks to Dwight uh, Raymond, Belinda Mate, and of course the PKSOI interns that PKSOI brought to join us. They have been taking note of everything that we've been saying. So thank you very much. It's Jonathan McMullin, Lauren Renault, Walter Stankiewicz, and Mary Juggernaut. Also, at the State Department, uh, we have Deborah O'Dell, who is our point of contact for all operational issues. And at the Department of Defense, of course, Sarah Capel is our key uh, point of contact. I would also like to take, thank our Swedish coordinating colleagues, the Armed Forces, here represented by Hans Grönlund, Granlund, and the Swedish police represented by Don Pettersson. Finally, last but not least, my colleagues in the Challenges Forum Secretariat, which is uh, Jivike Jönsson, uh, my deputy, and Anna Viktorsson, who has really been central to this whole project here uh, with the USIP, and uh, Johnny Börjesson, and back home we have Andrea Robus, who is engaged online as we're here, and also uh, Robert Gordon uh, for his contributions to our ongoing efforts. So finally, again, thank you everyone, and stay tuned. I'm warmly welcome to our annual forum in Yerevan, 56th of October. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much. <laughs>